the Wandering Emperor, he might make a real fine deck. Let's go ahead and see what the Oathbreaker Rules Committee came up with. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Uh, please remember to do, you know, the YouTube things if you've been here before. Otherwise, welcome Oathbreakers to the Signature Spellbomb YouTube channel. Today I'm going to be reviewing a featured deck that was created by members of the Oathbreaker Rules Committee about around the Emperor. I'm going to get on over to that deck. I guess it helps to actually be on the right screen. There we go. So this deck is actually named the Emperor's New Back to School Clothes. I think it was more of a timing issue because I don't really get what they're trying to do there. It does look like a fun and interesting deck, and we'll get into it, and we'll just go card by card. So first off, our commander is the Wandering Emperor. She's a new legendary planeswalker out of Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. She has Flash. I do feel like putting her in the command zone actually decreases her value. I feel like a Flash planeswalker that can use their abilities at Flash speed the first time when they first come into play is better when your opponent doesn't know you're holding it. Now, it might keep certain opponents from uh, targeting you, or it might make you a soft target. So I'm not certain where to rank this just yet. Our signature spell is Semester's End, so maybe this is where the reference comes from. For green and white, we exile any number of target creatures into our planeswalkers we control. At the beginning of the next end step, we return them to the battlefield under their owner's control with either an additional woman counter or an additional loyalty counter. This is actually a fairly interesting card, and being able to instant speed blink our commander to re-get or flash speed effects is a great idea. And if we've minus our commander, this is going to reset her back to her starting loyalty. So I do see a lot of value in this specific spell. We've got the original Wanderer. She prevents all non-combat damage that would be dealt to other permanents we control. And we can use her to exile problematic creatures. I do like the Wanderer. Um, this is broad protection for all of our creatures. And I like her in the deck rather than in this version in the deck rather than in the command zone because she's just kind of too expensive as a command zone uh, character. And a friend's a tree spirit for two white is a legendary creature spirit soldier. Whenever another non-token creature enters the battlefield under our control, we can bolster one. That means we can put a 1-1 counter on our creature that has the least toughness amongst creatures we control. So this is going to grow our army, but we do need to play a lot of creatures in order to make this worthwhile. A cartographer's Hawk for 1 and right. White is one of our ramp cards. It's a flying 2-1. It deals combat damage to a player if they control more lands than us. We get to return it to our hand if we want, and if we do, we can search our library for a land uh, plane specifically and put it on the battlefield tapped and then shuffle our library. This is very good. I do think this 35 cent card should be way more expensive. I want to pick up a bunch of them. Cavalier of Dawn for two and three white. It's a four six with vigilance. When enters the battlefield, we can destroy target non land permanent, and its controller creates a three three golem artifact creature token. This is very similar to Generous Gift or Beast Within. Or kind of frogify, but not really. When it dies, we return our artifact or enchantment card from our graveyard to our hand. So that recursion is really good for a lot of the other things we have going on in the deck. Next, we have Charming Prince, or one in white. I love this guy. He's a 2 3 modular creature spell that's either going to scry us two, gain us three life, or blink another creature we control. So you're starting to see that there's a theme here that we're going to start skidding and turning our wheel into pretty heavily. Uh, Epcrot Sight. I'm probably saying that wrong, but I loved this card when I was in the original Time Spiral Blah. What it does is it enters the battlefield with three 1-1 counters on it if you didn't cast it from your hand. I mean, blinking it will do that. But also when it dies, we get to suspend it with time counters on it, and it'll eventually recast itself and enter play with Three one counters on it. So this is very frequently a 4-4 four, four for 2 mana if you can play around it correctly. Grateful Apparition is Proliferate, which is good for our Planeswalker. It's good for our things with 1-1 counters on it. And a friends, of course, we just saw the Procra site. So this is going to be one of those cards we'll probably lean on. Don't be surprised if 
proliferate is something your opponents start removing. There is a politics play you can make with proliferate where you can proliferate other people's stuff as well. You can be like, hey, you know, uh, if you don't do anything about my X, Y, or Z card, uh, I'll put a woman counter on your planeswalker or on a permanent you control, you know, basically. Healer's Flock 3 White is a 3 3 flying lifelink creature. That is an amazing rate for that. I don't really have anything else to say. It doesn't really work with, it doesn't really have any blink noticeability. Uh, it doesn't have an enter the battlefield, so there probably might be something better for this slot. I don't know what offhand. Ishimaru Hound of Conduct costs 1 White. It's another legendary creature in this deck, and it's a 2 2. Knight of the White Orchid is another one of our ramparts. For two white, has first strike. It's a 2-2. One enters the battlefield. If an opponent controls more lands than us, we can go and get a planes. Lava Blunt Bring Vinch War for two and a white. When it enters the battlefield, we choose evens or odds. It has protection from each mana value of the true chosen value. Linking this to make it the right protection against the right opponent is actually a useful plan since that protection will get us past blockers it'll keep them from killing it so something to think about loyal warhound for one in white uh when enters the battlefield if an opponent controls more lands than us we search our library for basic planes put it on the battlefield it's three one with vigilance so really kind of good martyr for the cause when it dies we proliferate mother of runes we can tap it to give a creature protection from color of our choice it's my uh, opinion that this card is in the deck for twofold reasons. One, when a creature has protection from a color, it can't be blocked by that color. So this is evasion in this deck, but also it protects our key creatures and prevents them from being removed. Ornithropter of Paradise for a two colorless, just taps for one man of any color, and it's a zero two. Sanctum Prelate for one and two white. When it enters the battlefield, we choose a number. Non-creature spells with mana value of the chosen number can't be cast. So this is just a stacks piece, kind of. It's going to help us control the game and maybe make it into the later game. Again, we can blink this to change, you know, the number. So, Selfless Squire. It's a 1-1 one -one flash. When it enters the battlefield, we feel all 1-1 one -one damage. That, all damage that will be dealt this turn, and we put that many 1-1 one -one counters on it. This is kind of amazing. To play this at flash speed, it is a great protection spell that might end up a big beater. And to blink it off of an instant speed spell, to do that again when we're in risk or jeopardy of losing the game is good. Skyclave Apparition, again, good blink target. It exiles a permanent with mana value for less. Uh, when it leaves the battlefield, the opponent gets an XX blue losing creature token. So they never get back the original thing we exile. So blinking this can actually help us remove multiple permanents throughout the game and replace them with essentially vanilla creatures. Solemn is good. It enters the battlefield. We can search for blight, basic land card, put on the battlefield tap. Uh, when it dies, we draw a card. When we blink it, we get to get another land. So it's just good. Stoic Farmer for three and a white. When it enters the battlefield, we search for library for planes card, reveal it. If an opponent controls more lands than us, we can put it onto the battlefield tap. Otherwise, we put it in our hand and we can foretell it for a little bit cheaper. Ultimately, the mana cost works out the same, but this can be a turn two and turn three play pretty easily, rather than having to wait till turn four. Sun Titan for four into white is a six six with vigilance. Whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks, we can get a permanent card value three or less from our graveyard from the battlefield. Most of our best of blink targets are actually mana value three or less, so this is going to get us a lot of additional incremental value as the game continues. Weathered Wayfarer for one white. If we pay one and tap it, we can search our library for a land card, reveal it put it into our hand, and then shuffle. We can only activate this if an opponent controls more land than this. This is a 1-1 one, one, uh, card. I like it. I kind of wonder if there is a cheaper than 1099 version, since this is the mystery booster rare. So, Water Strike for 4 and a white. Uh, we exile target creature, then proliferate. Condemn for 1 white. We put target attacking creature on the bottom of its owner's library, and then we gain life equal to its toughness. Mana tithe, we just counter a spell unless target player pays one, which is not something you see in white very often, which is why this spell is hilarious to me and definitely something I think a lot of decks need. I don't think most players know that they might accidentally run into a counter spell when playing against a mono white deck, and it can be funny when that happens. 
Forge to Plowshare, Exile Target Creature, its controller gains life equal to its power. Unbound Potential. For one in white, we can put a 1 1 counter on up to each of two target creatures, or we can proliferate. Or if we spend two extra mana, basically we pay for it twice, we can do all of that. Animation Modular. When we put 1 1 counters on a permanent, we can pay one. If we do, we create 1 1 servos. We pay three and tap, we can basically duplicate a permanent on target thing. So this is kind of fun. This can be used as a makeshift proliferate for loyalty, but also this can give us a pretty constant stream of small creatures to help block for our face for the most part. I don't think it's great for going wide, though, in the deck. Arcane Signet, you probably already know. Aider Virtue, whenever a equipped creature dies, exile it. Equipped creature is going to get plus two plus zero. The It's going to give any creature it's equipped to the abilities of each card that is exiled with it amongst, you know, flying, double strike, all those things, as you can see. There are quite a few creatures in this deck with flying and vigilance that are low cost. Lifelink, that one three cost bird actually works really well with Eater of Virtue now that I think about it. So maybe it does have a really good use in this deck. Belwar Stone. Mox Diamond, Armored Ascension, if Enchanted Creature gets plus one, plus one in flying for each planes you control. Hmm, I wonder why we're ramping so many planes out of the deck. Curse of Silence, we name a card, spells with the chosen name Enchanted Player cast, costs two more to cast. Whenever Enchanted Player casts a spell with the chosen name, you may sacrifice it if you do draw a card. This is really good if you kind of know what your opponents are playing and you know there's something they're playing that could derail you. Or if there's a particularly abusive Planeswalker or Signature spell, you could actually choose that card name and make it a little bit harder. Legion's Landing. When enters the battlefield, we create a 1-1 Vampire Creature token with lifelink. When we attack three more creatures, we transform it into the land. I'm just going to flip this over so we can see what that is. It's a Ganto, the first four. We can tap it for white. We can pay two and a white and tap it to create a 1-1 one, one Vampire Creature token with lifelink. Again, that's pretty good with Eater Virtue. Um, I would say this is probably not the worst blink target since it does make us creatures when we blink it, but most of our blink spells, you may have noticed, uh, uh, target creatures. So I don't know that we're going to get to do that very often. Frustration of a Ganjo. On one, we get a basic planes card. On two, we discard a card. And then if we do that, we can return a permanent mana value two or less from a graveyard to the battlefield. We're going to find quite a bit of use for that. A three, we exile the Saga and it returns to the battlefield transformed as Architect of Restoration, a three, four vigilance creature that whenever it attacks or blocks, we create a one, one colorless spirit token. Now into the lands, we have Cash Soul Ardenvale. Makes a lot of sense. It is still creating those creature tokens. And it also cares about planes. So I guess that's worth noting. I think... Oh, here we go. Cave of the Frost Dragon. Don't know that I really need to explain that one. Aganjo, Seat of the Empire. Very good in this deck. Bidding a Watchtower actually becomes a 1-5 soldier until end of turn. There was a cycle of these lands. I liked the fairy one the most for its time period. It came out in one of the Urgas uh, sets originally, I want to say. Angelic Grange, one enters the battlefield. Uh, we put a woman counter on our creature with control. We do have to jump through hoops to do that, but it does work with the rest of the deck pretty well. Oh, what did we do there? And then we've got a planes. Now, after this is their maybe board, and there's some really good things in the maybe board, but they do increase the cost of the deck. So I do want to caution that, but they are some great ideas. I wish it wouldn't do that. Mm, come on, computer. My mouse double clicks sometimes. So Esper Sentinel, uh, whenever our opponent casts the first non creature spell each turn, we draw a card unless they pay X. Putting a bunch of 1 1 counters on this makes it very hard for them to pay X. That taxes both a pain to them and beneficial to us because we do need some card draw. Ranger Captain Eros will let us tutor one of our small creatures. And it also says if we sacrifice it, we can stop our opponents from doing stuff. So it is kind of a stacksy piece. Cruder of the Guard lets us, you know, again, tutor one of our smaller creatures. Yoshimaru the Ever Faithful. Uh, when another legendary permit enters the battlefield under our control, we can put a 1 1 counter on it. So it works really well with the rest of the theme. This is one I definitely think. If you have a copy, you should slide it into this deck. Amiria uh, Shattered Skyclave. 
On the land side, if we pay three life, it enters play untapped. On the other side, we create two, two four, four angel warrior creature tokens with flying. Non-angel creatures we control gain indestructible till our next turn, so there are some really good edge cases for that. Path to exile. Oh, I don't know why I trust this to do anything. Tithe. It's another card that helps us get some planes. Aether Viral, another card that lets us shade uh, creatures into play. Chroma's Memorial, it's going to give all of our creatures all of the keywords. Well, not all of them, but a, a very good smattering of them for seven mana. Since we are ramping so much in the deck, the odds we actually will be able to do that are good. Alter the Brood, since we are making so many tokens, we're going to have so many permanents entering the battlefield, blinking and entering the battlefield the second time, you know, creating tokens. This is going to mill every opponent every time we do those things. So this is kind of a combo piece if we can't get our combat damage through. It's a good win condition for the creature strategy decks. Archaeomancer's map, of course, it's very big on that. We get more lands into our hand and we play more lands when opponents do things. Drazi Monument, all of our creatures are going to have plus one, plus one flying and indestructible if we're willing to pay the five. Beginning of our upkeep, we sacrifice a creature. So all of those tokens we're making work very well with the monuments. You can kind of see why some of these cards are good uh, trade-offs. Oathkeeper, Takanano's Daisho actually is... When we equip creature dies, we turn that card to the belt under our control. If it's a samurai, this is from the original Kamigawa. So that's interesting. Shadow Spear is, of course, Shadow Spear. Authority of the Consoles is kind of a staxy card. Your opponent's creatures now enter the battlefield tapped. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under an opponent's control, we gain a life. Land tax. Ganjo Castle from the original Kamigawa. Myriad of the Sky Rune. Caracas, which, if you have one, definitely play it. And that's it. That is the whole deck, including the kind of uh, maybe boards they put together if you want to upgrade it and you want to grow it as you play it. I hope you, uh, I hope you enjoyed this deck tech, and I do hope that we see the Commander Rules Committee make more decks because I think it gives people a good starting place and a good place to grow as they learn more and they play more Oathbreaker. Now, having said that, below me here are my uh, Oathbreakers, my subscribers here on YouTube. If you want to be on this list, please go ahead and hit the, you know, the little thingy below. On this side of me are my patrons. There's three of them, and I love all these people the most. If you want to be on this list, well, you know what to do. You've been on YouTube. Over here will be a video. Other than that, I hope you have a great day, and thank you for stopping in, Oathbreakers. I hope you get in some great games.